Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome. The Pan Family Murder. Who Killed Big Harpan? This episode written by Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, the format of the show, if you're new here, well, first of all, welcome. Is the Matthew, or one of my other writers, but in this case, Matthew, have I said that enough, Matthew, uh, has written this script and I'm going to read it. I never read it before. Jen, a wonderful video editor, is going to edit this afterwards. And that's how we roll here at The Casual Criminalist. If you enjoy the show, make sure you leave a review on uh, Apple Podcasts or if you get we have like a 4.9 rating on spotify with like thousands of reviews so thank you very much i saw that the other day and then i was like i was looking at another podcast and i was like a podcast that i really like and they had like 100 reviews and i was like holy shit, you guys are out there you guys are out there smashing that five star button which i love um also maybe you're watching on youtube in which case you can see me hello enough faffing around let's jump in Here at The Casual Criminalist, we do not often shy away from difficult questions. <laughs> What's that question? Simon, when he st- every comment on this show, like when I'm on YouTube and I look at the comments, it's like Simon started this show somewhat opposed to the death penalty, and now he's calling for the death penalty every episode. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because I discovered there are people who need to die. Jesus. <laughs> Not Jesus. Like, Jesus didn't need to die. God rest his soul. <laughs> Instead, we make our opinions known on controversial topics such as the death penalty or which substances are appropriate to join moderation while filming YouTube videos. Caffeine. I I have I never drunk while doing an episode. I've never had a glass of anything while filming videos in my entire career, which I realize is kind of strange, but also not that strange because I'm always at work. (laughs) And I don't think I've ever drank the whatever job I've done. There's been no situation where it's like, let's have a beer. At work. Jesus, get some sun, man. Today's sponsor is the legends over at Vessi, who make 100% waterproof shoes that make embracing water an absolute joy. That's what they say in their copy points. Uh, For me, it's like my feet don't get wet. (laughs) I'm not... I mean, actually... I say that I'm not splashing around in puddles, but I really am these days because I have a three-year-old kid who gets extreme joy from, uh, like, what should she say? She's not, I just like splashing in muddy puddles or something like that. She watches too much Peppa Pig and uh, she's like, dad, do it as well. And I'm like, okay, because I have Vessies on all the time because they're the only shoe you will ever need. No more soggy socks. They're also extremely comfortable. And look, let me tell you why Vessies are truly special. Look, I said they're already waterproof. That's through something called Dymatex technology. This isn't something where it's like, oh, they're a little bit water resistant, but if you put them in a river, your feet are going to get wet. No, no, no. As long as obviously it doesn't go above the ankle. <laughs> These are waterproof. They are as waterproof as Wellington boots, as we call them in the UK. I think you Americans call them rain boots. It's incredible. The water just flies off them like a duck's back. Also, they're unbelievably comfortable. They're surprisingly lightweight. They do this amazing thing. I'm not sure what it is, but you get them and you're like, oh no, they're a size too small, but I got them in my size. And then you walk around in them for like half a day. It's not uncomfortable and they sort of expand to fit your foot somehow. It's amazing. Uh, I Vessi started sponsoring me a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago now. I'm not really sure. And ever since then, I have not worn another pair of shoes right now. I wasn't even planning on showing these. I'm wearing their boardwalk shoes, which are like their summer ones right now. And it rains in summer still, doesn't it? Like in the afternoon, the thunder comes and uh, I never have to worry about that. So look, special deal for you guys. Go to vessi.com forward slash TCC and use code TCC for 15% off your order. Uh, I can't say enough good things about Vessi. Just go get yourself a pair and you'll see what I mean. And now back to today's video. And also, that was a, that's a slippery slope, isn't it? If I was just like, yeah, sure, I'll have a glass of wine while doing this episode. And then the next thing you know, it's like, oh, that works well. And then you're having a glass of wine with every episode. And seeing as all I do is make episodes, quickly I'll just need a new liver, won't I? So with that in mind, I'd like to pose a question to you that I don't think has ever been answered on this channel before. It is a question that does have a simple legal answer, but it does not have a simple ethical one. It involves a police practice that has helped solve numerous crimes. However, the catch is, I'm not going to reveal the question until the very end, because today's story is extremely relevant, and the information provided to you throughout will be vital in answering it effectively. Ooh, okay, that's a strong teaser. That's very nice. I'm excited to get through this episode then which is quite long, I believe. So if you're just here for a good story, feel free to disregard the question at the end and simply enjoy this episode as you would any other. But if you'd like to exercise your mind, hold on, because there are some less black and white things than they first appear. Okay, I like this. I love answering questions like this. Join me, audience. Come on, don't just sit there. 
Well, I don't know what the question is yet. <laughs> Maybe it's something that's like, oh, I can't answer that. It's ethically challenging. Um, well, look, enjoy the episode. Let's go. The Canadian Dream. As I see it, there are few things more terrifying than the idea of leaving everyone you know behind, traveling across the world and attempting to start anew in a land that is so foreign to you, you can't even read the name on the street which you'll be living. Setting out into the unknown with nothing more than the promise of opportunity and without any aid, support, or lifeline. It makes my stomach hurt to think about it, yet there are people who do just that every day as they seek a better life for themselves and their families. In 1979, Hui Han Pan, a political refugee from war-torn Vietnam, arrived in Canada and began working toward this better life. He was an experienced engineer and quickly found a home in Scarborough, one of Toronto's many suburbs. Interesting aside, uh, Vietnamese is one of the largest immigrant groups to Czech Republic, where I live. So there's loads. I, I, I went to Vietnam years ago, and I loved the food. Like, the food was amazing. And then I didn't have it for years, and then I moved here. And I'm like... There's Vietnamese restaurants everywhere, and they have all this amazing food. <laughs> so that's nice for me. And also, they serve it in like big portions. Like I remember in Vietnam, there was like small portions and lots of little different things. But here it's like, yeah, here's a huge pile of noodles with some delicious meat. It's so good. If you haven't had Vietnamese food, thoroughly, I like a bun cha or a bun bo nam bo. <laughs> where he met a young woman named Bic Ha, another refugee from Vietnam who had immigrated to Canada in 1980. The pair were soon married in a little ceremony in Toronto. Now excited to start a family of their own, they found jobs at Magna International, an auto parts manufacturer in Aurora, Ontario. Here, Hue scored a position as a tool fabricator, while Bic Ha worked on the manufacturing floor constructing the car parts themselves. These jobs paid well enough, however, the work was grueling. Bic Ha had it the roughest as she worked long hours in miserably hot conditions, handling scalding hot car parts that just moments earlier had been molten aluminium. In the winters, the factory floor was uncomfortably hot, but in the summers, it was downright nightmarish. They both opted for overtime whenever it was available to them, and by the time their work days were complete, their feet and backs hurt, and it took everything in them to stay awake. Yet staying awake is exactly what they had to do. As said the Pan family's motto, family comes first. And Hue and Bic Ha practiced what they preached. Every evening, no matter how exhausted they were, the couple worked with their two young children, Felix and Jennifer, to help them finish their homework, get ahead in school, and go beyond what was expected of them. They pushed their children hard, expected excellent grades, and enrolled them in extracurricular activities that they hoped would earn them a spot at a good private middle and high school. It was a challenging life for the entire family, yet they persevered. After decades of work, this never-ending drive paid off. It allowed the Pan family to purchase a nice home in a safe neighborhood within Markham, one of Toronto's other suburbs known for its large Asian population. And by the early 2000s, the pair had even managed to save over $200,000. And Huey was driving his own Mercedes-Benz, while Bihar was driving a Lexus ES300. I like this story so far. It's like, I don't know, you can't help... It's like, <laughs> you like rooting for the underdog. And I feel that, you know, immigrants like this are underdogs, like Matt set up. They come to a new country... And it's cool when they end up with a beamer. <laughs> These things, they said, were nice to have, but their greatest achievements were their children's achievements. Thanks to their parents' success, both Felix and Jennifer were able to attend expensive private schools like the ones Hue and Bihar had always imagined, and neither child had to worry about holding down a job or saving for college because those things were already taken care of for them. Instead, their spare time was spent volunteering and performing other services that both helped their communities and also looked good on a college application. Felix and Jennifer had been given everything they needed to build upon the success that their parents had achieved, and build upon it they did. Felix was academically gifted and often achieved near-perfect marks, and when it was time for him to start applying to colleges, he was the creme of the crop. Every school in and around Toronto was eager to accept him and eventually found a spot at a prestigious university where he studied mechanical engineering in the hopes of following in his father's footsteps. Jennifer was no slouch either. Her grades were all good also, but where she really excelled was in the arts and athletics. By the time she entered high school, she had been taking piano lessons since the age of four and was on the path to becoming an Olympic-level figure skater, a goal that many people thought she had an excellent chance of achieving. Holy sh**. It's like immigrants. It's such a good story. Like Immigrants come to a country, work really hard, and then their children are like ultra-successful. It's... Yeah. I don't know. I like I like vibe with that. I like that sacrifice. I like that... that that attitude is cool. Immigrants, we get the job done. However, unfortunately for her and her doting parents, a knee injury ended up killing her dream of somewhat someday competing professionally. It was a disappointing time for the family, to be sure. But even after this setback, 
Jennifer was determined to succeed in life. She shifted her focus back to academics and began studying to become a doctor, a goal that her parents eagerly supported and pushed her to pursue. <laughs> so, oh, you can't be an Olympian. Let's just become a doctor instead. But also, I mean, people who succeed at one thing tend to also succeed at other things because it's not necessarily just about them being good at that one thing. It's about the kind of attitude that they bring. And it's like, look, if you're getting to be the level of Olympic figure skater, that's a lot of hours and a lot of work and some really pressury parents. And then it's like, if you're going to be a doctor, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of hours. And you got some really pressury parents. It's, you know, it's also going to work for you. To say that Hue and Bikha had accomplished something impressive would be a massive understatement. Together, they had immigrated to a foreign land with nothing but the clothes on their backs, worked hard to provide for their family, and had been rewarded for it in almost every conceivable way. Their success, police believed, was the exact reason that their family was targeted. The Canadian Nightmare at a little past 10 p.m. on November the 8th, 2010, emergency services in Markham, Ontario received a frantic phone call from a young woman who stated that her home had been broken into by three strangers and her parents had been shot. The caller was 24-year-old Jennifer Pan, and in the background of the call, Hue was heard shouting in pain and screaming desperately for help. Jennifer pleaded with the dispatcher to send help and said that the three men had entered her home unexpectedly, stolen her family's valuables, and left her tied to a staircase banister. She said she'd only managed to retrieve her cell phone from her back pocket after the men had already fled the home. When the police arrived, they discovered a truly disturbing scene. Hue was lying on the front lawn with two gunshot wounds, one in his shoulder, one in his face. He was unresponsive, but alive. Barely. Behind him, they saw a trail of blood leading from inside the house, and it appeared as if the man had been shot inside and somehow managed to drag himself outside to scream for help. As a single officer tended to his wounds and waited for paramedics to arrive, the rest of the team entered the Pan's home cautiously to begin clearing the scene. Immediately, they discovered Jennifer with her hands bound behind her back and tied to the staircase banister as she had described in the 911 call. She was uninjured, but very frightened. As they followed the trail of blood left by Hui to the basement, they found Bihar's body lying in a pool of blood with multiple gunshot wounds. She was pronounced dead at the scene. After officials had finished clearing the home completely, they cut the bindings off Jennifer's wrists and she immediately rushed to her father, who was then being loaded onto a stretcher and placed in an ambulance. She was nearly inconsolable as the flashing red lights carried him away toward the nearest hospital. Once Way arrived, a trauma team began to prepare him for surgery. Eventually, they were able to remove the bullets and he was moved to the intensive care unit, but his chances, the doctors said, were slim. Back at the crime scene, police were searching for evidence, but finding very little. The Pan family's home itself did not have a security system. However, investigators did receive camera footage from a neighbor's home that showed the three men approaching on foot. They'd walked across the Pan's grass and entered through their front door, which was unlocked. Now, although they didn't enjoy the idea of dragging Jennifer downtown after such a traumatic incident, investigators knew that collecting her witness statement quickly was vital to their investigation because it allowed more opportunity for her to either forget or repress vital information. And since Felix had not been home during the time of the attack and her father was unlikely to recover, Jennifer herself was the best lead they currently had to catch whoever was responsible. She was the only person they could talk to who had witnessed the horrors that night in person. At around 2.30 a.m., a detective transported Jennifer to a local police station. She was seated inside a stuffy room, given a box of Kleenex, and asked to describe in detail the events leading up to the attack so that the police could hopefully understand how and why the Pan family had been targeted. While speaking through tears, Jennifer explained that the previous day had started out rather mundanely. She had woken up at 9.30 a.m. as she normally did, practiced piano, and chatted with her friends on the phone. Her father had left for work at his normal time, and her mother, who was not scheduled to work that day, left around midday to visit Jennifer's old grandfather. She said she then made herself lunch at around noon and began studying piano history as she waited for them to return. Later that afternoon, at around 3.30 p.m., her mother arrived home and began preparing the family evening meal, and soon after, her father also returned from work at his usual time. After eating together, each of them went back to doing their own thing. Hue went upstairs to do some work on his computer. Big Hart left the home to go line dancing, and Jennifer invited a friend over to watch a movie on the living room television. Then, at around 9 p.m., the movie was complete and her friend returned home. Jennifer went upstairs to watch the television in her room and call another friend on her cell phone to chat before bed. 
As she did this, her father was also winding down for the night in his bedroom, and her mother, who had just returned home, was relaxing downstairs. So far, everything about the day seemed completely normal. However, this is where things took a turn. At approximately 9.30 p.m. from inside her bedroom, Jennifer heard her mother shuffling around downstairs and called her father's name loudly. Jennifer then hung up the phone, turned down the TV, and realized that her mother and father were speaking to one another in English, something that neither of them ever did while at home. She then heard several other voices, deep male voices, that she did not recognize. At about this time, unfamiliar footsteps came running up the stairs to the second floor, and Jennifer listened quietly as her mother, father, and the men began arguing and struggling with one another throughout the home. Terrified, she placed her ear on a closed bedroom door, listening silently and waiting for the voices and footsteps to leave so that she could peer out. After a moment of silence, she became convinced that everyone had gone downstairs, cracked open her door, but was spotted by a hooded man. Because the hallway was dark, Jennifer was not able to provide any details about the man's appearance, but he said that he rushed at her, took hold of her arms, and tied her hands behind her back. He told her that he had a gun, ordering her to stay quiet or he'd shoot her in the head. Then, after the man had checked Jennifer's pockets for cash and led her downstairs into the pitch black living room, she spotted the silhouette of a second man standing behind her father and a third man standing over her mother, who was then seated on the living room sofa. Jennifer said that the man beside her had a Caribbean accent and was demanding money from him. As she and the first man reached the base of the stairs, he pushed her to her knees, pressed the gun to the back of her head, and demanded to know where her mother's purse and her father's wallet were. Seeing Jennifer in distress, Hui began pleading with the men as Bihar attempted to stand and rush to her, but the third man pushed her mother back on the sofa. Due to the language barrier between them, her mother was having trouble understanding what the men kept trying to say. The man kept pushing her back down onto the sofa and yelling the word, purse, angrily at her. Seeing that the other men had the situation under control, the second man began searching the, homes down, the home downstairs for valuables. Thinking that her mother may have crammed her purse inside the kitchen refrigerator to hide it from them, he opened its door and Jennifer was able to get a good look at him for the first time. This tiny light revealed that he was a black man with dreadlocks wearing a hoodie pulled over his head and a bandana covering his lower face. This seems like a very risky, like they're just breaking into a suburban family's home to steal some valuables and they've got guns. This is like going to prison for the rest of your life territory for, what, a few thousand dollars in stuff that you're going to have to sell? Like, is this really risk rewards? Is the risk reward of this really worthwhile? Why aren't you breaking into an empty house? Why aren't you burglary, burglarizing rather than robbing? Burglarizing is a much less serious crime. It's like a crime that doesn't make you go away forever for the rest of your life. But like, this is robbery and ultimately murder. What? The, the risk-reward ratio is way off. What are you up to? Pleading with the men to let Jennifer go, Hui told them where to find his wallet. It was upstairs in the master bedroom. With her hands still tied behind her back, the first man led Jennifer back, up, back upstairs to search for it. But unfortunately, the wallet was nowhere to be found. Jennifer did start find some cash in her mother's nightstand, but it wasn't very much. The man, <laughs> someone broke into my house. I was like, they were like, where's the cash? And I'll be like, there is no cash. It's 2023. I've got a bank card. Do you want to go to the ATM? Like, what the fuck? There's maybe a few pounds, like or like uh, equivalent, in the little jar by the date by the door. That you know when you get change for something and you drop it into the key key box, key key thing, the key bowl. You know where you keep your keys when you drop them when you come in the house. Like, there's no cash. <laughs> there's no cash. <laughs> Why would there be cash? What? No cash? You're a cheap ass. The man then led Jennifer around upstairs as she gathered small amounts of money that the family had stashed in various places. This included the tip she'd earned while working as a waitress in her father's emergency fund. In total, the amount she found for him was relatively small and nowhere near what he was hoping to find. With no patience remaining, the men then tied Jennifer's hands to the banister, where she'd later be found by police, and returned downstairs to Hui and Bihar. Jennifer said that she heard the men marching her parents down the basement steps as the first man berated them. He shouted, You lied to us. And then she heard two gunshots, followed by her mother screaming. There were two more shots. And then all was quiet. After this, the man in charge said that it was time to leave, and the men were heard running back up the basement stairs and exiting the home. At this point, Jennifer was able to retrieve her cell phone from her pocket and dial 911. She held the phone at her hip, as high as her bound hands would allow, turned the volume up all the way, and shouted into it to be heard. Too many unknowns. Once Jennifer's statement was finalized, she left the police station and went to visit her father at the hospital. However, investigators were not finished with her yet. They still had many questions about the home invasion, but they also knew that they needed to wait, gather more evidence, and collect their thoughts before proceeding. 
This is because several details in Jennifer's story didn't quite make sense to them, and while they didn't have any reason to believe that she was purposefully lying, they strongly suspected that she knew more about the attack than she was letting on. Holy shit, okay. That is a twist I did not expect. Wow, okay, let's see what's going on. We're like, why would... Okay, strong, like, police vibes right there. Respect to the police if something dodgy's going on. Because I'd just be like, no chance. No chance. Let's look after her. I'm going to find out who did this to your parents, sort of shit. That's what be going through my mind. But these police are like, what's up, Jennifer? What's up? <laughs> okay. This is because throughout the interview, Jennifer's demeanor had seemed somewhat odd given the circumstances. Most of the time, witnesses and victims of horrific crimes like the one Jennifer had just experienced will be emotionally charged and eager to help police in any way they can. And since they are usually in a state of heightened awareness during the crime, many can provide vivid details about the incident with little effort. This usually results in them speaking and answering questions rapidly and without much thought, so they can get information out as quickly as possible. In other instances, victims may be in shock and cannot remember anything at all about the incident. Jennifer's statement, however, was unlike either of these. Throughout her interview, she had spoken quietly, mumbled, and taken an unusual amount of time to think before answering certain questions. This baby was understandable, considering uh, what she'd been through. But what concerned police greatly was that her behavior was inconsistent, as she did not show the same hesitation when answering questions about her family's day prior to the attack. These strange behaviors only appeared when speaking about the break in itself. It sounds like she's having to think about it. Like one, you know, when you're just recalling. So she's like, I did this and then I did that. And then she's like, create, being more creative, which is requires more brain power, so more hesitation. While this didn't prove anything, it gave the police the impression that she was answering some questions honestly, while either making up answers or trying to remember answers for others. At several points, Jennifer seemed to recognize that she was taking a long time to answer and apologized by saying that she was thinking because she didn't want to say the wrong thing. Which is smart. I think that's a pretty good reply. Because you're like, yeah, no, 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 well, of course I'm hesitating more. This is the important part. I really want to think about it. Solid reply. Solid lie. If she is lying. In addition to this, while Jennifer was visibly upset, sleep-deprived, and shaken by the whole ordeal, it's completely irrelevant. I got up at five o'clock this morning because my kid was just like, Hi, Dad! I'm done sleeping! And I'm like, I'm not! Why? Why are you done five in the morning? <laughs> I was so tired. And now I'm so tired. <laughs> And I was like, I could take a nap in this like super comfortable chair. I got in my office and I'm like, no, I got so much work to do. <laughs> got to record the casual criminalist. Sorry, let's get back to it. Her emotions had seemed to rise and fall erratically, and the words and phrases she had used throughout the conversation seemed odd. One moment she was stuttering on the verge of tears, and seconds later she was relaying information clearly and without issue. It was like someone was flipping an emotional light switch on and off repeatedly, or perhaps she kept forgetting that she was supposed to be upset. At one point, Jennifer even referred to her mother's killer as the gentleman. And then later, while describing what she had heard after the gunshots were fired, she imitates her father's cries for help and sounds almost like she's mocking him. That is such a weird thing to say. Like, I don't know, maybe it's common in her vocabulary. But be like, oh yeah, I'd just be like, the man did this, the man did that. You could say, yeah, the gentleman did this, the gentleman did that. But that would be like very formal. It's, I don't... It's weird, isn't it? It's weird. Very, very suspicious there. While some wondered if Jennifer wasn't telling the whole story because she'd been threatened by the men and was afraid for her life, others leaned towards a more sinister narrative. They believed that Jennifer was somehow involved in the crime herself. While this prospect seemed both unthinkable and unlikely, they weren't ruling out any possibilities, nor were they taking any chances on account of how cold-blooded the crime had been. When Jennifer left the station that morning, she unknowingly did so with a police tail attached to her that would follow her everywhere she went for the next several days, including to her mother's funeral. While observing her, officers noted that Jennifer's demeanor did not seem natural. While she did usually seem upset when the moment demanded it, she had not cried at all during her mother's funeral, even when her older brother was standing beside her and bawling his eyes out. Out. As the investigation continued, they were also left puzzled by several more inconsistencies that they couldn't wrap their heads around. First, Jennifer's story made the entire incident seem like a robbery gone wrong, but the crime itself didn't make sense. The Pan family's house was nice and clean, but it was modest. Huey and Bihar earned a healthy income, but nothing other than the expensive cars in the driveway alluded to them possessing substantial wealth. The family lived frugally. None of them wore fancy or flashy clothes, or did they display large amounts of cash or brag to their friends or neighbors about the savings that they'd got stashed away for retirement. Yeah, and those savings, the 200 grand or whatever they saw, saw, saved, it's not going to be under the bed. It's going to be in like a retirement fund or a bank account. 
On top of that, even if the robbers had known about the pan savings, what reason would they have to believe that the money was stashed away inside the family home exactly? The men had seemed certain that there was a large amount of cash somewhere, but why? Or what had given them that idea? Could it have been Jennifer? It's uh, the only reason that I'm thinking this is because I'm being told to think this and because apparently the police are suspicious. There's no shot that I'd be suspicious about this. To add to the confusion, another obvious problem was the fact that the police were not investigating a robbery, they were investigating a murder. Why would the men needlessly escalate their crimes when their faces had been covered and there was no reason for them to kill either Hue or Big Ha? Exactly. The risk reward ratio is way off. And I don't think it's I don't think it's a coincidence. There's something suspicious going on. Surely there had to be a reason that the pair were not just set free once it became clear that the robbery had failed. And if there was a reason that the killing they were killing witnesses, why did they choose to leave Jennifer alive? She was a massive loose end, and neither the police nor Jennifer could come up with a reason that her parents had been shot while she had been spared. At one point, Jennifer had suggested that it may, they may have let her live because she cooperated and her parents had not, but this seems very unlikely. The next set of major problems surrounded the nature of the 911 call itself. According to Jennifer, she was able to call for help using her cell phone, which had slid into her back pocket after hearing the intruders enter her home. This made sense, but what didn't make sense was why the man who had searched her pockets for valuables had not discovered and confiscated it. Oh my god, great point. Yeah, they took all her shit away. Why wouldn't they be like... They'd see that phone bulging out of her back pocket and be like, yo. <laughs> Let me have a look at that. Even if he hadn't intended to take the cell phone with him out of fear of it being tracked, he would have at least taken it temporarily so that she could not stealthily call for help while they were inside the home. Obviously. Also, regarding the cell phone, if Jennifer's hands had been tied during the time of the call as she claimed, she would have had a very difficult time dialing 911. You see, her hands were bound extremely tightly to the point that her bindings were cutting off circulation, and her cell phone was an old flip phone. This meant that she would have had to retrieve the phone from her back pocket, flip it open, dial 911, and put the phone on speaker while her hands were almost, certi almost entirely immobilized and the phone was out of her line of sight. While this was not completely impossible, it would have been very difficult, and Jennifer had made it sound easy in her retelling. Yeah, that's a bit suspicious, isn't it? I wonder if you can ask Siri, <laughs> like, to, to, to call 911 or whatever, or, like, to call for an emergency. <laughs> I imagine that's, like, too much. Because you could be, like, trapped like that. You could be like, uh-oh, okay. <laughs> it would be very useful. But also, I can imagine there's lots of accidental calls. I remember there was some setting. I got a new iPhone. I don't know what couple of iPhones ago or whatever and they'd introduced some new thing where it was like you could silently call for nine uh, for like emergency services like here 112 by pressing the the top two buttons on the outside of the phone repeatedly or something but the problem is that's also the sort of thing you do when you're increasing the volume and you're not sure what side the volume is so you're just pressing both up buttons at the same time so the number of times that I open my phone it'd be like woo woo dialing emergency services I'd be like what are you doing why no stop <laughs> this isn't necessary I was just trying to listen to something louder Setting the record straight. To put investigators' minds at ease, they asked Jennifer to return for a second interview to go over the events in detail once again. This time, however, they wanted to start by focusing on Jennifer herself and her relationship with her parents. Now, after giving you a brief rundown of the Pan family during the start of this episode, you might have been left feeling like you have a decent understanding of the family's dynamic. However, like any family, the Pans had secrets, and as investigators spoke to Jennifer, those secrets began to spill. Jennifer said that although she and her father had gotten along well for most of her life, the past few years had put a strain on their relationship, and the biggest reason for this tension was her father's unreasonably high expectations for her. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, you're going to be an Olympic skier, uh figure dancer or whatever it was oh you can't do that you're gonna be a doctor no pressure <laughs> just i worked my whole life so that you could do these things so uh pressure yeah that's intense as she explained Hui was not an easy father to please he had worked hard in life and succeeded and he expected his children to do the same it sounds like he expects them to do more because it's like well i came from this and did this and you're gonna come from this and do that you know, it's like, it's leveled up one level. Because he came from nothing and became a successful immigrant. Now, she's the daughter of successful immigrants and is going to do even more than they did. Or at least that's the expectation of the parents. And that's pretty intense. However, instead of allowing them to decide what they wanted to do with their own lives, he had made the decision for them before they were even born. He wanted Felix to be an engineer like him, and he wanted Jennifer to become a doctor. Now, while neither of these career paths were easy, Felix had abided by his father's demands far better than Jennifer had been able to. He had excelled in everything he put his mind 
combined who achieved excellent grades and earned his degree in engineering, as his father had insisted. However, Jennifer was not so fortunate. Although her grades were above average through most of her high school years, they were not high enough for Hui. So instead of pushing herself beyond her capabilities, Jennifer decided to focus on extracurriculars that she excelled at, such as playing the piano and figure skating. This decision to prioritize anything besides her grades did not make Hui necessarily happy, but her early success in figure skating did allow him to recognize her potential and stop hounding her about her grades. It wasn't an ideal solution, since Jennifer wasn't really interested in professional figure skating either, but she went along with it because it got her father off of her back. This is a hard one, because it's like, I'm a, I'm a father, and it's like, I want my kids to succeed in all of this stuff, and it's like, that'd be cool. But also, <laughs> I just would rather they be happy. Like, the most important thing to me is that they're happy. And I don't know, I kind of was raised that same way. Like, my parents never particularly put any particular pressure on me. I never felt that I had to do some specific thing, which is really nice, because then I got to kind of choose what I wanted. They were my, I, I did definitely feel pressured that I had to go to university. I don't feel that that was a choice, uh, but that's fine. I kind of okay with that. It was fun. And then career wise, or well, whatever, they were like, you can do whatever you want. And that worked out quite nice. And I hope that I can put my children down the, that sort of similar, similar path of letting them choose what they want to do. It's a complicated one though, because it's also like, yeah, I'd like them to be successful. I'd like them to do something cool. But also, you know, no pressure. I hope. I hope I can I hope I can do that. I hope that I can walk that balance or whatever it is. We'll see. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, Jennifer suffered an injury that ended her athletic career early, and after it became clear that she would not recover well enough to compete again, her father's demands for academic success re-emerged. While she wanted to become a piano teacher, Hui insisted that she was not skilled enough to achieve meaningful success in this field, and demanded that once again she refocus her efforts on becoming a doctor instead. He's probably not wrong. I mean, she could become a piano teacher, sure, if she's very good at piano, but like achieving what I imagine he sees as success. I don't know, piano teachers particularly well paid? I don't think so, not like doctors. So, and I imagine finance money is a large part of this, but becoming like an elite pianist is like, that's going to be, that's really hard. That's, there's not very many people, people who earn a living playing piano, like a good living, like a famous pianist, right? It's very unlikely. Over the next few years, as Jennifer realized that she'd not be able to achieve the goals her father had set, she began to feel like a failure as her sense of self-worth plummeted. To prove herself to him, she said that she was forced to turn to deception. When Jennifer entered high school, she began forging her report cards to show better grades. This placated her father, but since he was no longer pushing her to succeed, her grades began to gradually slip even lower, and she ended up failing her senior year due to both poor test scores in one of her acquired math classes, as well as truancy. The truancy was a whole other can of worms. You see, Jennifer had also been skipping school to hang out with her secret boyfriend, Daniel Wong. Harry didn't approve of her and Daniel's relationship for several reasons, primarily because Daniel was not Vietnamese and was a small-time drug dealer. Well, isn't that fair, Sean? But he had also forbidden Jennifer from dating altogether because he believed that a relationship would interfere with her school and volunteer work. Yeah, also, to be fair, I wouldn't be very happy with my daughter dating a drug dealer. When graduation day came, Jennifer said that she should have come clean, but was terrified of how her father would react and decided to purchase a fake high school diploma and lie about being accepted into a local college. Oh my god, you're falling down the, the rabbit hole of lies. It's like, the one thing you know, you're changing a C into a B on a report card, and the next thing you know, you're pretending to go to university. <laughs> Instead of taking a step back, apologizing and finishing high school, Jennifer told him that she was on the fast track to becoming a doctor. 20 years later, she's just like working another job, has no degree. And whenever she sees her dad, she's like, yeah, well, I've got to, I've got to rush off. The, uh, the emergency room is waiting for me. <laughs> Patients, you know, they're waiting for surgery, which is something I do. <laughs> Overjoyed by her success, Hui then purchased several necessities for Jennifer's college education, such as a cell phone and a laptop, and gave her the money she needed for tuition and living expenses. He believed that this money would allow Jennifer to continue focusing on her academics and not on money. However, instead of using it for its intended purpose, which would be impossible because she's not at university, <laughs> Jennifer then spent the next six years accepting and using these funds to purchase books for classes that she was not enrolled in and renting an apartment for herself and Daniel across town. To keep the six years, <laughs> can you imagine afterwards? She'd be like, Dad, I got some news. <sighs> Didn't go to medical school. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, funny one, funny one. <laughs> no, I'm not lying. I'd be like, oh, shit, what the f Six years? <laughs> That's a super long time. 
To keep the lie alive, she also called home periodically to tell her mother and father made up stories about her non existent friends and professors. And at the end of each semester, she presented more forged documents that showed passing grades. As I said, this charade went on for over six years. And when it came time for her to graduate and return home permanently, Jennifer did the exact same thing she'd done in high school. She presented her parents with a fake diploma that they hung on the wall and celebrated. They had no idea their daughter was not a doctor and was secretly a high school dropout. Somehow, despite several close calls throughout the years, Jennifer had gotten away with her lies. However, now her real problems were just beginning. Obviously, way expensive expected her to use that fancy new degree it paid for to start earning some money of her own, and this proved to be a bit of a massive headache for Jennifer, which she could not find a simple solution to. Unsure of what to do next, she attempted to buy herself some more time by telling her parents that she was having trouble finding a job in healthcare. She said that until a position became available, she'd volunteer at a local hospital without pay, and Hui and Biha, who were proud of her for sacrificing her time to help others, agreed to continue supporting her until she landed a paying job. The cheek, the nerve, the gall, the audacity, and the gumption. Now, it's unclear how long Jennifer planned to keep living her fake life, but before she could figure out a way past her lies, her father became suspicious when she wasn't able to show him a uniform or a badge for her new volunteer position. One morning when she left for work, Huey followed Jennifer's car across town and was led directly to Daniel's apartment. To say that he was furious would not even begin to cover it. Oh my God. You had to go in and be like, why aren't you at work? She's like... I don't, I don't work, I'm not a doctor, Dad. And this is why drug dealer boyfriends, we're married. Oh, no! For lack of a better term, he absolutely lost his when he discovered that Jennifer had been lying to him since high school. It's over six years later! <laughs> ah! This is so crazy! <laughs> Bad wasted isn't her entire college fund on her loser burnout boyfriends. As the full scope of Jennifer's lies came into focus, Quay was livid and he gave her an ultimatum. Stop dating Daniel Wan, finish high school, enroll in college, and get a life back on track or she'd be disowned entirely. There was no negotiation. There was no time to think or consider other options. Her cards were on the table and she had a losing hand and they both knew it. Now, at nearly 25 years old, Jennifer was very much an adult. However, she was still completely financially dependent on her father for support as she had never held a job for more than a few days and was completely ill-prepared by every measure to enter the workforce. But she's not incompetent. She's reasonably smart. She can play piano. Just go play piano, teach piano or something. You don't have to rely on your dad. Like, I know it's going to be hard. Just go get or get a minimum wage job or whatever, if that's what you want to do. Like, I'm sure you can get a minimum wage job. You might have to like, <laughs> what were you doing for the last six years? Well, let me tell you a story. <laughs> She could have walked away and stayed with Daniel, but that would have meant losing everything important to her, including her family, her inheritance, and her future. Seeing no other options, Jennifer returned home with her tail between her legs and found herself in a new type of misery. Since Huey had purchased her laptop and cell phone, he confiscated them both and forbade her from contacting anyone outside the family home. She was not allowed to drive anywhere on her own. She was not allowed to see her friends. She was not allowed to go anywhere except for her piano lessons. And while Huey didn't physically log Jennifer inside the family home, he did draw a line in the sand and told her that if she crossed it, she would not be given a third chance. Jennifer then spent the next two years of her life isolated as she finished high school and started working on a degree in pharmacy, a degree that Huey now felt was more achievable for Jennifer than becoming a medical doctor. And this is the life that Jennifer had been living when her mother and father were attacked. So this started off with like no motivation whatsoever. And now I'm like, oh look, motivation. After hearing this long-winded admission, the interviewing officer knew that he had found a clear motive and a much more convincing narrative than a burglary gone wrong. He knew that, although she wouldn't openly admit it, Jennifer likely hated her father, but he didn't believe that she had pulled the trigger herself. The video evidence corroborated her claims that three men had been inside her home at the time of the attack, but the detective was sure that Jennifer knew who the men were. He just needed her to admit it. Um, Jennifer, at this point, that's when you get a lawyer. I say, lawyer, 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 lawyer. <laughs> Need a lawyer. Give me a lawyer. <laughs> um, and maybe honestly, before this, although that's a bit weird, isn't it? If you're just being interviewed as a witness, like in this sort of situation, should you get a lawyer? I'm always kind of like, yeah, just get a lawyer. Just get a lawyer. Just in case. Just talk to a lawyer. You never know what's going on with the police. They might suspect you of a crime, even though you're... E imagine if she's innocent and they suspect her of this. It's, it's always a good idea to get a lawyer, isn't it? I've never been in the position where I've been arrested and been interviewed for something. Or not even arrested, just as a witness. So, okay. I don't know. I'd be like, I want a lawyer. <laughs> Please. 
At this point, the witness interview had gradually morphed into an interrogation, and the detective began walking Jennifer through her story once again. However, this time, her narrative began to unravel. After telling her story so many times, Jennifer was beginning to forget small but important details, such as the fact that her hands had been tied when she was led downstairs to where her parents were being held. At one point, the detective requested that Jennifer stand up and demonstrate how she'd been able to retrieve her cell phone from her back pocket and dial 911, and Jennifer was able to show him a semi-believable reenactment, but this still wasn't enough to convince him. He then took on the role of sympathetic friend. He asked how she felt about her father's ultimatum and suggested casually that his actions justified what had happened to him. <laughs> if a police officer is like, oh, he caught was coming to a dinny. The answer to that is no. No, he didn't. And I definitely would never agree with that statement, officer. And the fact that you said it, maybe you did it, officer. <laughs> maybe you thought he deserved to die. <laughs> Jesus. The detective obviously didn't believe what he was saying, but he was hoping that Jennifer would be more likely to confess if he appeared non-judgmental to the crime and understanding of her and her father's domestic issues. For the next four hours, the detective continued to chip away at her story, however Jennifer refused to crack and he was forced to end the interview. She was once again allowed to leave as a free woman. Discouraged and possessing no other evidence to go on, they began planning their next moves. However, this is when the unexpected happened. A Surprise Witness on November 22, 2010, nearly two weeks after the events that launched their investigations, detectives contacted Jennifer and requested that she return for a third and final interview. However, this time the police's position had improved considerably. They didn't just suspect Jennifer of hiding something, they had a witness who could testify to it. Days earlier, unbeknownst to Jennifer, Hui Han Pan had defied all expectations and awoken from his coma. He had suffered minor brain damage from the gunshot wound to his face, but his memories from that night were crystal clear, and when he learned of his wife's fate, he was compelled to make a statement. From his hospital bed, Hui told police that he had witnessed Jennifer standing beside and speaking jovially to the three assailants, and that her hands had not been bound the way she had described when he and his wife were escorted down the stairs to the basement. He couldn't hear what was being said between Jennifer and the men, but he could tell by their body language that she was completely comfortable around them and believed that she knew at least one of them prior to the attack. There was also no robbery and no mention of his wallet or Bihar's purse. The entire point of the break-in had been to murder him and his wife, and Jennifer had completely fabricated the rest of the story. Who is she persuaded? She managed to persuade three people to get in on this? For I guess it's because she's going to inherit the money and then split, with, split it with them, right? But why, why three? Why are you involving so many people with your crimes? When Jennifer sat down with the detectives once again, she was not aware that her father had awoken from his coma, nor did she know that he had given this statement. By this point, detectives were less concerned with Jennifer's guilt and much more interested in the identities of the three men. They hoped that by presenting her with a version of events that made her seem less culpable, they could coax a conf confession out of her slowly and get her to give up her accomplices. At this point, your lawyer, I assume, would be looking at very much getting you a deal. Like, you give up the three accomplices and we'll just lower it to manslaughter or, um, what's it called, where you take part in a crime but you're not the main, like, aiding and abetting? That feels a bit small for murder. But, you know, so you're not going to spend the rest of your life in prison, just, you know, a good decade or two, that sort of thing. You're going to be getting that deal, right? Once again, the detective took on the role of a sympathetic friend. He revisited her and her father's relationship, his overly controlling nature, and his high expectations for her. According to the detective, what Jennifer had experienced at the hands of her father was simple, straightforward abuse, and he said that sometimes victims, victims of abuse make decisions that seem irrational to regular people. He then shifted the converse. That's a very smart thing to be, path to be going down. Because it's like, oh yeah, that is abuse. And it's like, no, it's not. I mean, not like... <laughs> It's not like, I guess it could be like mental abuse, but it's just like, I, well, obviously it's not enough to, for him to be murdered. But even I'm like, like we see abuse on this channel. And this is like, let's say it's a three out of 10. <laughs> he then shifted the conversation to her and Daniel Wong and asked if either of them held any resentment over how her father had forbidden their relationship. Jennifer admitted that of course there were hard feelings between the three of them, but reiterated that she stood by her decision to break things off. She said that she knew that her father would never accept Daniel as a suitable partner and wanted to make him proud and repay him for all the lies by sticking to her word and finishing school, becoming a pharmacist and marrying someone he approved of. After spending two more hours rehashing the events of that evening and wearing down Jennifer's resolve, the detective then employed a controversial yet effective technique to get a confession. Lying. And this is the question, isn't it, Matt? Should the police lie? Is it okay that the police can lie to get someone to confess to something? And I think the answer, in my mind, right now, is yes. Like, if they're like, well, the other guy said you did it. 
And even if he hasn't, that's okay. It's just an interrogation technique. As the person in that room, you've got to be aware of that. Or more importantly, your lawyer has to be aware of that. Where the f*** is your lawyer, Jennifer? And yes, if you're not aware, the police are allowed to lie to you in most circumstances, and they often do so without hesitation when it benefits them. So hold on, because you're about to see how detectives got a confession out of Jennifer without a single piece of physical evidence against her. Based on the statement given by her father, the police knew that Jennifer had not been tied up throughout the break-in as she described, and the detective utilized this knowledge in a clever way. He told Jennifer that Canada's government utilizes a mass surveillance system comprised of thousands of tiny spy satellites that are equipped with heat-sensing technology and capable of seeing through solid objects such as walls and roofs. He said that these satellites have the ability to monitor and record the interior of Canadian residences and document who is inside the home, where they are standing, and what they are doing. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is it's like a sci-fi novel. Did you really think, like, this, one, it's extraordinary if this works, and two, it's extraordinary that you thought this would work. If someone said that to me, I'd be like, no, you don't. And if you did, you certainly wouldn't be telling me. Like, if you had this technology, you're not using it for this little murder. You're using this technology, and you'd be keeping it super secret because you'd be using it for, like, big... And um, obviously, murder is a big f crime. But this would be, like, a national security thing, and you wouldn't be telling me about it. Like, I'd have read... If, if, I, if that wasn't known about in the press, there's no way you're telling me, because that would be an enormous expose. expose. Like, the press would be all over that. And there's no way you're telling me just because of the murder. Like, no matter how bad the crime is. And even if uh, even if you were a terrorist planning the biggest terrorist attack ever, they still wouldn't tell you that. They'd be like, we found it some other way. <laughs> because they don't want you to know that they've got miniature spy satellites looking inside your home. Which, I mean, they don't. But they'd never tell you. He said that he'd been given access to these recordings and that after reviewing them, he knew for certain that she was lying. He said that those recordings directly contradicted her version of events and that it was impossible for her story to be true based on what he had witnessed happening inside the home the time of the attack. That she had not been tied up and they had not ransacked the home as she described. Those things happened after her parents had been led to the basement. Now, of course, the Canadian government doesn't actually use spy satellite to monitor its citizens inside the privacy of their own homes, as far as we know. But Jennifer had no way of knowing this. <laughs> Put it together, Jennifer! It's not that complicated! She believed the detective's story without questioning it and, feeling backed into a corner, admitted that she had not been truthful during her previous statements. It's at this point that a lawyer should have stepped in and ended the interview. However, she had still not requested one after over a total of 10 hours of intense interrogation. Jennifer, 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 what have you done? Foolish lady. Very. Foolish lady. The story that Jennifer then told the detective was so unbelievable that it dominated the news headlines in her hometown for days. She said that while she had originally hired the three men to kill for her, she had not taken out a contract on her mother and father. She had taken out a contract on herself. Let me explain. Jennifer said that when her lies were exposed, she has accepted her father's ultimatum and agreed to abide by his wishes by returning home. However, she quickly realized that she had made a massive mistake. She felt alone and isolated and hopeless. She loved Daniel, but she had been forbidden from seeing him ever again, and this left a massive void inside of her. She said that she felt as if a piece of her had been ripped out. Jennifer then said that she couldn't take it anymore. She wanted to die, but she didn't want to dishonor her family by dying by her own hands. She wanted to make her death look like a murder to spare her mother and her father the embarrassment, so she re-established contact with Daniel Wong and asked him to put her in touch with a hitman. Daniel complied and introduced her to the three men. She then took a contract out on herself. However, before the contract could be completed, her living situation improved. Jennifer was permitted to start speaking to her friends again, and her cell phone and laptop were returned to her on the condition that she stay in school and away from Daniel. According to Jennifer, her life improved so much that she changed her mind about wanting to die and tried to call the whole thing off. This is, I have to say, this is a remarkably clever play. Like, I did not expect to see that coming, but it's a very clever way of being like introducing reasonable doubt, right? Unfortunately, she said it was too late. The men she had hired were not willing to cancel the contract, and they showed up that night demanding payment. Now, if your eyes have not already rolled out of your head, hold on, because it gets even worse. They haven't rolled out of my head, just because I'm like, yeah, it's unlikely. Of course it's unlikely. But all we need, like, this shit's going to court, obviously. All we need is reasonable doubt. We just need the jury to be like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And this is enough. In my opinion, this is enough. This is how reasonable doubt gets introduced, and I think it's quite clever. So my eyes aren't rolling. I mean, balance of probabilities, I'm like, please. But I'm like, reasonable doubt's here. There's reasonable doubt. I got reasonable doubt. 
Jennifer said that because she was not able to pay them the 10% they were demanding to cancel the hit, they killed her mother and attempted to kill her father as a warning to her. This was supposed to motivate her to find the money they were owed, or else they would return and do the same to her. The hit was never supposed to be on her parents, they'd just been caught in the crossfire. That's why they had not killed her, as they were still expecting payment. It's good! I don't match like this is stupid! And I'm like, no, this is reasonable doubt! As soon as Jennifer admitted this, the detective knew that it was just another lie. However, it was a very consequential lie, and he was beyond thrilled to hear it. Okay. Not only had she admitted that she was lying to the police, but she had also directly implicated herself and Daniel Wong in a murder for hire plot and revealed that she knew the identity of her mother's murderers. She had just sealed her own fate. She wasn't going home that afternoon, and she'd very likely never be go going home again. Um, okay, sure, she's admitted to this, but she's admitted to worse. Like, the other option is she's like, I hired a hitman to kill them. This is how she sees her potential way of weaseling out of this. And sure, she's said, I know who the hitmen are, but it's just going to be her word against theirs. So, unless she's been writing down her crimes, which I hope she hasn't, because that's the number one rule. Don't write down your crimes. Jennifer then told the detective that the names of the three men were Lenford Roy Crawford, aka Homeboy, Eric Sean Carty, aka Sniper, and David Mylevaganam, a hitman who didn't even have his own code name. What a loser. Wrapping up the case. Although Jennifer continued to claim that she had never once intended to have anyone in her family beside herself killed, she was then promptly escorted from the interrogation room and booked into the local jail as an investigation into the three men she'd just named commenced. Using her confession, police obtained Jennifer's cell phone records, which included text messages between herself and Daniel, where they'd communicated her intention to have her father murdered. Uh-oh, you're writing down your crimes? Her text messages count, by the way. It's not just about writing it down in your super-secret diary. Um, text messages, emails, all counts. Don't write down your crimes. While searching through hundreds of messages in which the pair had plotted their crime, they saw a completely different person than the shy, soft-spoken girl whom they'd interviewed. They saw a greedy, scheming, self-obsessed person whose ultimate goal was to have her parents murdered so that they could collect her inheritance and move to another country with Daniel. At multiple points during their conversations, Daniel had encouraged Jennifer to seek a different solution by simply leaving home and coming to live with him, but Jennifer had refused. She knew that she would be disowned, was not willing to give up her inheritance. She wanted it all, and the only thing standing in her way, she said, was her mother and father. And so, with her mind made up, Daniel provided Jennifer with a second SIM card and gave her the contact information of a local hitman. <laughs> Daniel's like, yeah, now we should use a different SIM card to communicate. Because uh, we haven't been talking about murder. We've been writing it down in text messages. Daniel, <laughs> come on. Come on, small brain. This was Lenford Roy Crawford, a.k.a. Homeboy. The two of them then worked out a deal. Crawford would contact two of his men, Carty and Miles Ganem, and the men would then be paid a total of $10,000 once Jennifer's inheritance came through. That was what her parents' lives were worth to the three men, $10,000. The plan they formulated over text was simple. Crawford and his men would park outside the family home on a night that Jennifer chose and wait for her to unlock the front door for them. Then, once the way was clear and Jennifer was safely back inside her bedroom, she would flash her bedroom light on and off several times rapidly to signal that it was time for the three men to enter the home. Once they were inside and her parents were subdued and taken to the basement, she would then re-emerge and help Crawford stage a robbery that would serve as motivation for the break-in. Crawford would then bind her wrists and she would use her cell phone to dial 911 on one as the men made their escape. As a bonus, she said the men would be allowed to keep any money that they found while staging the robbery, and all three of them walked away that night with approximately $2,000 in cash, less than $700 each. It was an excellent plan, they believed, but unfortunately, it wasn't, and they were all too stupid to see it. Police had seen through their ruse almost immediately, and the three amateurish hitmen had botched the job, which only further cemented their fates. Eventually, Daniel Wong, Leonard Roy Crawford, Eric Sean Carty, and David Mile Verganum were arrested for their parts in the crime, and the trials for each soon commenced. In the end, all but Eric Sean Carty were tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. Carty opted to enter a guilty plea for a lesser charge after his lawyer became ill during his trial, and he did not wish to start over with another lawyer. He was deemed eligible for parole after nine years. Jennifer herself was also tried, and her father and brother both testified against her. She was found guilty, sentenced to life in prison, and forbidden from ever contacting her father, brother, or Daniel Wong ever again. She's now housed at the Grand Valley Institution for Women in Kitchener, Ontario. And a note. At the time of writing this in May 2023, an appellate judge has just granted Jennifer Pan, Daniel Wong, and the two hitmen who received life sentences a retrial for the murder of Bir Han Pan. This decision was based on the belief that the trial judge that oversaw the original cases did not allow the jury to consider any scenario that would have resulted in a charge that was less than first-degree murder. 
Well, that's because this was first-degree murder. They've been granted a retrial for this conviction. However, the appellate judge upheld their convictions for the attempted murder of Hui Han Pan. As of now, it's unclear how this decision will affect their sentences. Question time. Okay, so now that we've reached the end of the episode, it's time for me to present you with a question that I promised in the pre-intro. We're going to ask whether it's okay if the police lie to people, aren't we? And I'm kind of like, still like, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Like, the criminals lie, the cops can lie. It's just a game. One of the things that made Jennifer's case somewhat unique is that it is insolved almost entirely inside an interrogation room. You see, even without any physical evidence linking her to her crime, police were able to use Jennifer's confession to obtain a search warrant for her cell phone records. These records, as we have discussed, were the singular piece of evidence that ultimately tied the entire case together. But had it not been for her confession, police would not have had probable cause to subpoena them. Fascinating. So if she had had a lawyer, and a lawyer would like absolutely be like, let's not give them any reason to get that subpoena, because when I was saying, like, this is not a bad out, I'm assuming that's not the, <laughs> that there's not a pile of evidence that she's been texting to her boyfriend about murdering her fucking parents. Like, <laughs> and the lawyer would know this and be like, no, 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 no. And then there'd be no subpoena and there'd be no text messages and she'd probably get away with it, which is nuts. Get a lawyer. Or don't, if you're a criminal, then you can uh, go to prison where you deserve to be. Sure, they had Hui Han Pan statements, but his word was not considered reliable because it suffered brain damage during the attack, and no judge would have signed off on a warrant based on his testimony alone because he had not been deemed competent. That means that had Jennifer kept her mouth shut, it's very possible the police would have never solved this crime, or at the very least, they would have had a much more difficult time with it. The reason her case, and many others like it, are considered controversial is because of the way the confession was obtained. Police lied to her, and even though that lie was a ridiculous lie that involved heat-sensing spy satellites, it still tricked Jennifer into confessing, and many people argue that this is completely unethical. Currently, there are no laws in America or Canada that prevent the police from lying to a suspect. And as a result, police deception is a common tactic that is used daily, and it takes many forms. Sometimes this deception can be something very small, such as telling a suspect they already know what happened and encouraging them to be honest. However, other times the deception can be huge, such as when the police attempt to pit two criminals against one another by saying that the other has already confessed. This is the prisoner's dilemma, right? But no matter the circumstance, the goal of this deception is to pressure the suspect into saying something incriminating or revealing information that the police wouldn't otherwise have, and the techniques they use are so well established and well rehearsed that books have been written about how to effectively lie to a suspect in order to pry information out of them. And you know what's important? Lawyers Defense lawyers have also read those books, so they know what's up. That's why you need a defense lawyer. If the police were forbidden from lying to suspects, it's likely that many criminals would never be caught. Without using deception to exaggerate or outright lie about the evidence they have and the source of that evidence, many guilty criminals would go unpunished. That would mean more unsolved cases, more violent criminals roaming the street, and certainly more crime. So, while lying certainly has its uses, its downsides are also numerous. First, it further erodes the fragile trust between communities and those that are charged with protecting them. And at a time when police approval is at an all-time low in many parts of the world, that can be a major problem. More concerningly, those lies can also result in false confessions, especially from people who are either young, impressionable, mentally disabled, or simply unfamiliar with police interrogation tactics. This is because the people who do not know or cannot understand that the police are legally allowed to lie to them may try to justify or explain away non-existent evidence and inadvertently implicate themselves in the per in the process. Yeah, that's intense. Which is why I really... I believe there's some places where it's like, if there's no physical evidence, even if there is a confession, it's not enough. Because there's so many false confessions. I feel like there's got to be a middle ground. There's got to be a way to protect against false confessions while also allowing the police to lie during interrogations. And I think the answer to that is like, yeah, there's got to be something else. There's got to be some fragment of physical evidence. I'm not saying like, yo, no body, no crime, but like something lighter than that. For instance, if the police tell a suspect that they have his or her fingerprint at the scene of the murder, the suspect may assume that the police are telling the truth and attempt to explain away the evidence by saying that he or she was there for some unrelated reason. The suspect is innocent in this case, however, but what they do not realize is that by saying this themselves, they've placed themselves at the scene of the crime around the time of the murder, and even without the non-existent fingerprints, the police now have an admission that can be used against them in court. That's crazy. You've got to work out a way to protect against this. It's physical evidence. 
The US Department of Justice estimates that at least 50,000 individuals have been incarcerated due to false confessions resulting from police deception. And I don't need to explain why that is a problem. However, another statistic that is not tracked is how many times deception has been used to bring about an accurate resolution to an otherwise hopeless case. And that's because there are far too many to account for. Yes, that's true. And also in this case, it's not like she... Um, and I know we've moved away from this case, but what would really be nice is to see a case that where this happened. Because it's not just the confession that got her. There's also the evidence. The confession led to the subpoena, which led to the text messages, which led to her conviction. It's not the confession led to the conviction. There's that extra step. And I think by getting that extra step, it safeguards against this. Confession is not enough. I don't think. With that in mind, the question I've been teasing is this. Should the police be forbidden from lying to a suspect in order to coax a confession from them or gain evidence that they would not otherwise have? Why or why not? And I think the answer to that for me is yes, it's okay. Because the poli- well, one, where do you draw the line at what is a lie? Lying is not a black and white thing. There's definitely exaggerations and embellishments and, and stuff like that. And if every time that happens, and then it would be like, okay, well, we go to court, and then it goes through the motions, and then the defense lawyer is like, well, at minute 701 of the tape, you said this, which wasn't strictly true, so we want this evidence thrown out. And even if it's legitimate evidence, I think that's a really slippery slope. Getting a confession is fine, but a confession shouldn't be enough in my opinion. I look forward to hearing your answer, Simon, and reading everyone else's answers in the comments below. (laughs) What's your answer, Matt? What do you think? Don't cop out of this. What do you think? Oh, and this is nice. Matt reached out to Liam, who also writes for this channel and is a lawyer in the UK. And it's surprise cameo time. Okay, let's go. Hello there, I am Liam. (laughs) Another writer who works for Simon when I'm not doing cameos and lawyer from the UK. Doing cameos? Doing cameos in what? Oh, cameos like this. (laughs) Like a guest spot. Here we go. During the writing of this script, Matt reached out to me for my opinion on the same question he just asked you and our dearest fact boy. And due to my intense narcissism and inability to finish one of my own scripts, I asked Matt if I would instead be able to chuck my opinion at the end of his, especially considering the fact that I'm actually unsure for once to whether Simon will agree with me. Okay, so without further ado, let's get me fired! Okay, let's go! (laughs) You're safe, Liam. I like your writing too much. First, I want to premise this discussion with the fact that I'm not an American lawyer. I've only ever worked within the legal system of England and Wales, and there are two key differences between these legal systems when it comes to police lying. Firstly, in England and Wales, Section 76 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984, PACE, requires judges to throw out any confession if that confession is disputed, so long as the prosecution cannot prove that the disputed confession was not gathered through oppressive means. This means, effectively, if a police officer does lie to a defendant and his lie results in the defendant admitting to a crime, then that admission cannot be relied upon. The second restriction can be found in Section 78 of PACE. This enables the court to throw out any evidence that would be unfair to the defendant if allowed. This is also a section that the courts have used when dealing with evidence obtained from police lying. So, after all of that, you may consider that in England and Wales, we don't allow the police to lie to a defendant. But that's not true. We're actually the country that invented the rule that police won't be punished for lying, and I'm about to argue that that's a good thing. So firstly, let's get the erring guilty pleas out of the way. It's important to distinguish between a defendant that has rendered a confession and a defendant that has pled guilty. In England and Wales, and the US of A, when a defendant pleads guilty, it is the end of the case and no more inquiry will be held. Any guilty plea rendered because of a lie is therefore clearly a miscarriage of justice, especially if the defendant didn't commit the crime. Fair enough. However, I don't think that's an issue. Why not? Well, it's because of that narcissism that I spoke about earlier. Okay, Liam, go on. This is why lawyers exist, and if you have a lawyer and the police bring up this airtight evidence that bangs you to the crime, your lawyer is going to ask ask to see that evidence. When the police can't produce that evidence, the lawyer will tell you that the pigs are pulling porkies. Yeah, you're just like, okay. And the lawyer's like, show me, show me. You, you, what was the, what did they have? Show me the spy satellite heat footage, show it to me. And they can't, cause it's not real. It's so obvious, you just be like, show me. <laughs> so simple, that's why you need a lawyer. Show me. Now, some of you may be asking, but Liam, not everyone can afford a lawyer. Yeah, you, you wait, wait, hold up. 
No, this is a criminal case. You're entitled to a legal defense. And that's where you're wrong. In both the US and England and Wales, if you cannot afford a lawyer in a criminal case, then one will be appointed to you at no cost. Now, yes, not all of those legal aid lawyers are of good quality, but even the most basic lawyer should be capable of challenging that evidence. Yeah, <laughs> even the most basic lawyer, they graduate at the bottom of their class at a bad university, they'll be like, I'm gonna need to see that evidence, mate. <laughs> If they aren't, then the problem isn't with police lying, it's with the quality of the lawyers in your jurisdiction. So, now we have the issue of erring guilty pleas out of the way, what does that leave us with? It leaves us with dumbass criminals, such as I have been reliably informed the criminal in this case was. At this point, we should look at the law in general as your views will be decided by the philosophy that you bow down to. Fundamentally, there are three philosophies for the law. Natural law, the liberal atomistic approach, and the paternalist approach. Put very simply, natural law theorists hold that the law can be worked out in relation to a set of objective rights and wrongs. Liberal atomists thinks that the law's only purpose is to defend the rights of the individual above all else, and paternalists feel the purpose of the law is to protect individuals from harm. Uh, defend the rights of the individual above all else. Uh, worked out a set of ob objective rights and wrongs. I don't think there's such a thing as objective rights and wrongs. Sure, there are some things that are objectively right and objectively wrong, but most things fall into a big old grey zone. And then... Protecting the rights of individuals, that's a bit selfish. I do think it's the last one, paternalists. They, the purpose of the law is to protect individuals from harm. I, to me, that's, I think, I don't know, that's where I, that's where I, that's what I vibe with. It's about protecting people from harm and also punishing horrible people. <laughs> It's up to you to choose which one of the three that you ascribe to, and ultimately, I'm not going to change your view by arguing here, so I won't try. What I will say is, fundamentally, both the atomistic and paternalist views of the law uh, view criminal law as being charged with capturing criminals to protect individuals and wider society. So with that in mind, and with the fact that lying cops lead to guilty pleas is only an issue if you have bad lawyers, all we're really doing by lying to those accused of crimes is punishing dumb criminals. Oh my god, that's so true. You're just punishing people who don't lawyer up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So as long as you know to get a lawyer, you're cool. This is an advantage to you. I'll also add at this point that the principled argument does ignore plea bargains as plea bargains are dumb and should be done away with, such as here in England and Wales where we have no such mechanism. Yeah, we don't have plea bargains. That's a total like thing I just see in movies. Like, I went to, I, when I was at law school, I did a year and it was like, there we were studying criminal law or whatever. And I, there's no such thing as a plea bargain. That's just something in the movies. It's oh, okay. So that was the argument of a defense lawyer for police officers being allowed to lie. I didn't see myself making that argument when I woke up this morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Liam. Thanks, Matt. This was a great episode. I mean, sad, but also fascinating. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this show, please do leave it a review. Uh, that's if you're listening. If you're watching, smash that like button, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.